This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is James Gustav Speth, who is professor of law at the Vermont Law School and a senior fellow at Demos and the United Nations Foundation. His new book is America, the Possible Manifesto for a New Economy. And this book is the third book in a trilogy analyzing the American crisis. The other two books in the series are Red Sky at Morning and The Bridge on the Edge of the World. Uh, Gus, welcome back to Berkeley. Hi, Harry. It's good to be back with you. You're, you're a product, uh, in a way, of the 60s, and there was a song uh, then that we all used to sing by Joni Mitchell, I've seen life from both sides. You, you've seen it, th this, this American crisis from all sides in a way. Uh, uh, I, can't, so, I can't seem to hold a job. I keep moving yeah. around a lot. Uh. So, so your, your new book starts with uh, uh, your participation in a, 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 a peaceful demonstration, uh, pa uh, civil disobedience, against the building of the uh, Keystone uh, XL pipeline. Uh, yes. What led you to that? Well, um, you know, when, when I was in the Carter administration a long time ago, mm -hmm. uh, we put out several reports calling attention to the perils uh, that we faced with regard to climate change way back then, over 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, uh, and then at one, and my office was right across the street from where we were having this nonviolent uh, civil disobedient protest in, uh, in August uh, a year ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, and it just all came back to me that we knew so much way back when uh, about what to do about the climate change and what was a tolerable amount of buildup of these greenhouse gases. And nothing has happened, nothing serious uh, to deal with the urgency of this issue, which gets more urgent every day. And, um, so that was really the reason I was there. I, uh, you know, sort of proverbial end of the rope. We tried everything over those 30 plus years to get action from our government on this issue and, uh, and not much happened. And uh, Obama's done a few things uh, and I think they're very important what, what he's done, but it doesn't really capture the issue in, in all of its uh, seriousness or even come close. I, I made the reference to the 60s song because we should review your career because you you really uh, been in the environmental movement from the beginning you were Carter's chief advisor on the environment yes. you helped found two environmental organizations the envi uh, uh, the World Resources Institute and the National Resources Defense Council you led the UN's largest program for international development and you were dean uh, of Yale's environmental school. Uh, I, I, I saw a reference. Time called you the ultimate insider, but but so but this book is is taking a very dark view of the networks of problems that the country faces. Yes, uh, I, I I feel like I've been mugged by reality. Uh, the harder I, I looked at these issues when I stepped out of the trenches, so to speak, and and took my deanship uh, job at Yale and began to really reflect on where we were, uh, it, um, the problems are, are so overwhelming at this point, the daunting uh, set of challenges. Whether I looked, for example, Harry, at the, um, our international standing, and, and I, you know, I took the old OECD, the 20 advanced uh, democracies of the OECD, and, 
and looked at 30 different indicators of national well-being and, and international citizenship. And, and uh, you know, I, I knew we weren't performing well on a lot of these indicators, but uh, the fact is that we were at the very bottom or right next to the bottom on all 30 of these things. So, uh, you know, we have the highest uh, inequality, the lowest social mobility, um, the uh, most poverty, uh, the, the worst environmental performance even uh, at this point, the most inequality uh, for women, the, the lowest uh, score in material well-being for children, and on and on. Uh, and uh, so this is, um, so the real thrust of this book uh, is that um, when you have problems that encompass such a huge area of national life and well-being, uh, it can't be due to small reasons. Uh, we're having trouble with all, in all of these areas because we are working and trying to work in a system that uh, is not geared to producing good results uh, for our grandchildren, for example. I mean, I have six grandchildren now, and I worry a lot about what the, what the world is going to be like when they grow up. What's America going to be like uh, when they grow up? And right now we're headed to a bad place for them. Uh, and so I think it's a question of the system. It's the system, stupid. Mm -hmm. What we have is a, is a problem of system failure. And if we really want to make progress, uh, we've got to change the system. We've got to rewire, reprogram this operating system of our country so that it delivers good results for people and place and planet. And that's where we are, I think. Now, now if, if when one looks at your career, you, you were really uh, a liberal, a reformist, but, but somebody primarily focused uh, uh, on the environment. And what, what is, is very clear in this book, you now see that you can isolate one issue or, and reform in one sector, which has been disappointing, but n nonetheless, that's what the name of the game has been, yep. uh, uh, without looking uh, at uh, uh, all of the issues together. Yeah, well, let me put that in a little perspective. Uh, we are living and working today uh, all, uh, in a system that really prioritized profit and economic growth and international power. I think, I mean, those are the three priorities of, of, of this system. And the progressives of all stripes, whether they're environmental or social justice liberals or uh, people who are interested in fair taxation or, or civil rights, we all work to try to make that system work for us. And uh, we're all on the same boat, in effect, because we're all trying to in inject into this system values of fairness, and sustainability, and justice, and peace, and equality. and. Uh, and, and so it really is still, all the progressives are in very much the same boat. And we rise or fall together. And mostly we've been falling. I mean, these, most of these causes, uh, not all, but most have been, we've been losing ground rather than making uh, real progress. So I, uh, to make this a little more concrete, I, I scold my environmental friends. I'm still heavily involved with environmental issues, but I, I scold some of the big national groups now because uh, they're not... Uh, embracing issues like political reform. I mean, how could we, how could we hope to really win in, in on the environment uh, in a system that is uh, so rigged against us uh, politically, with all of this money and other things that we're, and and remember, the corporations spend ten times as much lobbying as they do on elections. We just saw a lot of money in this campaign, but uh, the uh, the slosh of money is still washing through uh, Washington uh, uh, today. Um, so, and I, I criticize the national environmental groups also for failing to embrace uh, social justice as a concern. I mean, we have a country where literally half the families are just getting by, paycheck to paycheck. And uh, in such a place, uh, it's very hard to, for environmental issues to make progress. And uh, you start talking about getting the prices right, which is this fundamental environmental prescription, uh, making, getting environmentally honest prices out there. Well, those are higher prices. Those are higher gasoline prices. Higher, you know, a little, a little bit on some things, a lot on other things. Uh, and yet, you know, people are very economically insecure. Uh, so as long as environmentalists neglect this issue of social justice, 
there will be severe constraints on what can be accomplished. Mm -hmm. you, you call uh, the subtitle of the book as a manifesto for a new economy. So, so and what, what you are uh, doing in this book is saying, look, these are the problems, they're across the board, and, and we have to have a guide for how we can change things, not just in, in one sector, but across the board. We do, and I think that means getting at the root causes of this, these multiple problems. They, they have, there are root causes uh, that, that under, uh, underlie uh, progressive failure across a broad front. And uh, so what the book, the main part of the book is to identify what these root causes are and to prescribe things that can you know, uh, change the situation, change the incentives that, that we now work in. For example, um, you know, corporations perform well given the environment that we have created for them, uh, but it's the wrong environment. And uh, so we need to not only have new measures that rein in the giant corporations, but we need to build a new corporate sector from, from the ground up. And I describe initiatives in both of these areas. Our, our consumerism is another dimension of, our, of this uh, system that we're in now that, uh, and, and you know, we have to distinguish between consumerism and, and consumption. Everybody needs to consume something. But consumerism is when you try to, to meet your basic needs, uh, to satisfy uh, your spiritual earnings in a way uh, with uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work, uh, but boy, do we do a lot of it. Uh, every day, in every way, mm -hmm. and are prompted to do even more all of the time. Uh, and, uh, and I think this, um, um, you know, we, but there are things that we can do ab uh, about consumerism. Uh, it's an artifact in part of public policy after World War II, and there's a lot that we can do to, to, uh, to get back to uh, our real selves. As one examines the, the operational plan, let's call it, of your book, what, what, you're really, what you're really saying is that we have to slow and halt the descent. In other words, we're going down faster and faster, and we have to slow that down, and that we, we have to uh, start the climb up, you say, which is to say we have to, uh, after identifying the problems and realizing that reform still has to go on, then we have to look to some kind of basic transformation, you know, of the system, uh, uh, and that we have to identify the alternatives uh, that uh, to the current system. So, so you're really trying to be, and I'm trying to be fair here, a reformer and a radical at the same time. Is that is that fair? That's fair. Uh, I, you know, as I say in the book, we have to reform and transform. Yeah. I mean, just give you a, uh, the clearest example that I can think of. Uh, you know, we have to do something now about climate change. Uh, the deeper systemic changes that I propose and discuss at length in, in the book uh, are going to take some time, mm -hmm. uh, and it won't be easy. Uh, well, the initial steps we need to take on climate won't be easy either, but we need to take them before we will get these deeper systemic changes uh, moving uh, in our society. Uh, one of those deeper systemic changes is to break with our, our growth fetish. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as you're prioritizing economic growth and you are forced to uh, feed that beast, to give the corporations whatever they need to keep growing, uh, it's going to be very hard to deal with the deep change that's going to be necessary to, uh, to deal with the climate reality uh, that we face. But, you know, before we get there, we're going to have to do something to already to, to, to change our energy uh, trajectory and our climate, our emissions uh, trajectory. And how, and how we, I think we know this, but help us understand even better, how bad is it getting with regard to climate change since you wrote that first report 30 years ago? Well, I would say it's uh, not just getting worse, it's, it's getting worse at a more rapid rate now. Uh, one thing that, that gives you some hope in a kind of perverse way that we might actually get action now uh, as opposed to what the, the for, for example, in 2008, 2009 when Al Gore got the inconvenient truth out and all of this, 
uh, that was a real boomlet. And we felt like uh, in that campaign in 2008, for example, uh, that whether Hillary Clinton or Obama, Barack Obama were elected, uh, we were going to get action on climate. But there's a difference now that makes it a little more hopeful. Uh, in a, in a, as I say, in a somewhat perverse way. Well, what we're seeing now are, are, are not uh, graphs and, and argumentation. We're seeing real effects. The sea level going up, uh, storms getting worse, uh, drought and uh, forest fires and uh, other problems uh, in, in the whole interior uh, of our country. Uh, so things are, already, are really changing. And I think that changes the political dynamic. Another thing that gives you grounds for hope that we might finally do something on climate is the fact that the federal government really needs to raise new revenues and, uh, and somehow the, and, and whatever approach you take to uh, the climate action uh, involves putting a price on carbon, uh, carbon emissions and uh, generating some revenues as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe that will help uh, also. So I have a little bit of hope, but you know, we had hope before that we were going to do something and, and I must say uh, since the uh, election. Uh, President Obama has actually sort of waffled a bit, uh, mm -hmm. put it out there as an issue he was thinking about and then backed off a little bit on it later. And so we don't have the kind of leadership we need on this issue. That's for darn sure. It's interesting because if we look at the first four years of the Obama administration and a number of the crisis, that may be a handle on which to sort of look at your ideas. So, so you know, we've had Katrina. We've had uh, the San Sandy, and uh, uh, what what you're arguing, or the logic of your book, is that as we respond to those crises with FEMA, you know, with publicity and so on, we, we have to deal with those problems, the, the situation that people have found them in. But on the other hand, we have to use that as a platform to see the bigger picture and find at least the first steps toward the transformation. Yeah, I think, um, I think it, was, it may have been um, uh, Rahm Emanuel who the other day, uh, fairly not too long ago, said something like a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Mm -hmm. And it is. Uh, we need to be prepared for the crises that will come. I think there'll be more economic crises. Uh, I think there'll be uh, climate crises. Uh, and we've had some already, um, and it, we need to get out in front uh, to, to put these issues before the public, uh, uh, and then uh, we'll be much better prepared, for example, than we were in 2008, and uh, this recently with Sandy and this terrible hurricane, we'll be better prepared to make real progress in the wake of these uh, crisis situations. Now, now how, do, how do we take control of the narrative and, and there, there seems to me to be two enemies to the narrative. One is that as we deal with the crisis, as we give charitable contribution, as we, you know, see the terrible things that have happened and we, we reach out, uh, that's a short-term solution to a really bigger problem. So, so how do we impact the overall narrative so climate change is is really brought to the table as a powerful narrative uh, about, oh, this is one of a series that's going to be coming unless we do something. Well, there's nothing like leadership. Um, and, um, and, you know, we need transformative leadership. Um, and you just look at what uh, Mayor Bloomberg did when he endorsed uh, uh, President Obama for re-election. Uh, you know, he put the climate issue central in, in his endorsement. And I think, uh, you know, that was real leadership. It brought the issue forward. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, leadership can make a huge difference. Uh, um, I think, uh, you know, our, we've lost a lot of ground on, on, in journalism, I'm afraid, at this point, uh, that needs to be uh, recaptured. Uh, uh, newsrooms have shrunk uh, dramatically. Uh, coverage uh, is much more geared now that, uh, than uh, in our youth, for example, to, to commercial success. Uh, it's very segmented. People are very tribal about where they get their news these days. And, um, and, and don't, you know, it don't, we don't have the, the broad uh, integration uh, of the nation through 
newscasts like uh, Walter Cronkite uh, used, to, used to give. It's just different now. Uh, and um, I noticed that, uh, you know, for uh, the longest time, NBC News, uh, uh, Brian Williams uh, in the evening was, you know, talking about these ferocious uh, weather events and the drought and other things, uh, but they wouldn't mention climate as having, you know, any, anything to do with that. And yet it's now, you know, very clear that these patterns, uh, perhaps not the, a particular thing here that day, but these patterns are, are driven by, uh, by climate change, uh, as exacerbated by climate change. And uh, so we need, um, you know, some very intelligent people that I quote uh, in the book who have studied uh, the, the course of U.S. journalism have proposed, for example, that we set up, uh, you know, independently but federally funded programs for sustaining American journalism. And they point out that most advanced democracies have, uh, uh, you know, governmental support for good journalism and that those countries that do the most of that rank the highest on the Economist Democracy Index. So it's not some, you know, government subversion of the news. It really works if you do it right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there, I guess, when, when one looks at your analysis, one of the realities we have to deal with is the vested interests embedded in the system, in, in, the, in the governing structures and system, the constitutional system that, that uh, uh, really hinders getting the word out yeah. on these issues. And it, it, it would seem that it's not just Brian Williams. He, he's being pushed in that direction by whatever makes money for the network or whatever. I, I mean, yeah. there, there's some really uh, uh, weighty uh, obstruction to an alternative narrative emerging. Yes. Well, I think that's right. I think the, uh, so my, you know, what I discuss in the book um, are things that our political system uh, and we at the, at the local level uh, need to do. Um, but most of the things that I call for in the book that would, that would help address these issues at the national and international levels uh, really require a, a strong, you know, muscular, democratic government. Uh, which is not what we have. Uh, we have a beaten down, uh, somewhat tired, uh, certainly gridlocked, uh, and pretty much bought uh, government uh, now. And so the book ends up with a, the strongest plea I, I can make for political reform. And political reform is something that should engage, you know, a broad spectrum uh, of, of Americans, uh, whether they're Tea Party or or uh, progressive liberals or, or whatever, because if we don't solve the problems that our democracy faces, you know, we're, we're gonna be in deeper and deeper trouble. Uh, so the book identifies uh, sort of, sort of my, my top 10 list of pro-democracy political reforms to really wrest power back from the corporations and the plut plutocrats and, and, and give it back to real people. And then you have to ask, well, how do we get that done? And so the book ends with a chapter on building a movement, mm -hmm. uh, because unless we can really, in the wake of this 2012 election, come together and form a movement for democratic reform uh, in, in our country, you know, we, this is the moment that, that I think uh, something like that could be born. Uh, and, and without this, uh, uh, you know, profound transformation in our politics to a real democracy, real citizen sovereignty, uh, and, and a beating back of this creeping corporatocracy and plutocracy that we face now. I wonder, you know, things are not going to go well. There, there is a, uh, uh, when one reads the book, a thought that was running through my mind at least was the notion of the leap from all the good things that are going on, say at the local level, or in alternative business structures in, in local communities, or something like the the 99% uh, movement, right. which which moved beyond the local and offered the possibility to to create that spark, which would then lead to the transformation. But but there's a failure of ignition when it comes to to making that leap to transformation. Right. Well, I think we do. We haven't quite um, you know 
had that ignition yet. I think that's a good concept. Uh, uh, I was a big supporter of, uh, of the Occupy uh, efforts. Uh, they've now, uh, there's been a sort of diaspora of the, these efforts now uh, out, of, uh, out of Wall Street and uh, all kinds of things, including helping with the Sandy uh, recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I, you know, I think that was good. I think the, the, the so-called Madison uprising uh, that was in Madison recently, mm -hmm. Madison, Wisconsin, where uh, the, uh, the demonstrations there uh, around the state capitol uh, are still, uh, reverberations are still being felt. And they don't feel that that uprising is dead at all in, in Madison. And, and I think these, uh, the, the tar sands uh, demonstrations, which were uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, re-upped uh, just uh, uh, recently in, in the context of the wonderful Bill McKibben's uh, Connect the Dots uh, tour that he's on. Um, and, and so we have these, uh, these sparks going off uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, around the country, uh, and this is, uh, this is very, very encouraging, I think. And, and I think people need to, to, to you know, recall that so much, of what, so much of the progress in the U.S. has come as a result of people putting themselves on the line being prepared to sacrifice, being prepared to take risks. Uh, I grew up in the civil rights movement, uh, uh, not so much in it as watching it, uh, honestly, uh, but uh, I learned a lot from that. Uh, and, and I think it, uh, if there is a model in recent memory of what we need to do now to, to save our country, f you know, and to build a better America for our uh, grandchildren, it is the civil rights movement. And, and what, what should we learn from that movement? What was distinctive about it? But what was like, uh, what are the lessons for other movements uh, uh, today? Well, I think it has to do with organization, uh, leadership, people being willing to, uh, to put themselves on the line, uh, to see that nonviolent civil disobedience may be necessary sometimes, uh, and, and to take some risks. Uh, uh, we're just a little too comfortable right now, and some of these problems that we face are, I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't say there are a lot of people that are uncomfortable right now, to say the least, uh, uh, and unemployed and, uh, and, and basically suffering. But uh, in general, a lot of the country is, uh, is a little too comfortable with their situations, and, uh, and I, I think we need to break out of that uh, lethargy and, uh, and, and remember some of the lessons uh, of the 60s. And, and Harry, you mentioned something I wanted to talk about, which was the, um, the, the really fantastic things that are happening across the country at the local level. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, there's, if there is a, a big sign of hope in the country, it is, is communities uh, rebuilding themselves, uh, taking innovative steps uh, at, the, at the local and, and regional uh, level across the country, including new forms of enterprise. Uh, you know, hybrid corporations, public-private hybrids, uh, uh, profit not for profit hybrids, worker owned enterprises, consumer owned enterprises, the whole co op movement, the state, the public banking uh, movement, the food movement. Uh, all of these are coming together in communities around our country and uh, transition towns and community revitalization efforts. So, this is very encouraging. And, I, I, uh, and, 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 and to me, these are examples of bringing the future into the present so people can, can really not just benefit their local communities, but others uh, can see that change really works. And so the, more, the deeper these changes become and the more they proliferate across the country, I think that's a tr source of tremendous inspiration and reassurance, reassurance that something better does exist, mm -hmm. that we can create something better, that we know a lot about how to get to America the possible. It's, it's so, you know, you hear so often that, uh, you know, we just, uh, well, there's no, there's no alternative. Well, there is. And there are models around the world uh, that we can look at for inspiration, and there are models in our local communities that we can look at for inspiration. Uh, your, your training is in the law. You went to Yale Law School, and, and you were a you clerk for Hugo Black. And, and I'm just, uh, you, there's no real mention in the book of legal structures. And uh, uh, I, I'm curious about that and the extent to which the law can be a bridge between these local experiments uh, and uh, what might become a national experiment. Well, the, the, the law is in the book in, in this sense, uh, Harry, and, and that is that um, 
you know, the book is full of policy prescriptions that require legislative action. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, there's the, just a long list of different, in different areas where I talk about the type of, of le legislation uh, that, in effect, we need at different levels of government. Um, so I think that um, the law is very important, but here, let me mention something. You know, you've asked about the, you know, what happened to my environmentalism along the way, in a way. Um, you know, I think a question environmentalists need to ask themselves is, you know, what is an environmental issue? Is it air pollution, water pollution, and climate change? Well, yes. Uh, but I would say that an environmental issue is, is any issue that has a big effect on environmental outcomes, right? Why shouldn't that be the scope of environmental determination in our country? If something is ha having a big effect on the quality of the environment, environmental outcomes, well, it should be embraced by environmentalists as one of their concerns. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, we're not, as an environmentalist, there's not an embrace of the, uh, the desperate need for pro-democracy political reform. There's not an embrace of uh, electoral politics of the way it ought to be. I mean, the Tea Party, whatever you might think of it, is a marvelous example of going from, you know, protest to movement to power quickly. And we need to see that in some, in the progressive area uh, as well uh, now. So, you know, environmentalists aren't uh, embracing electoral politics. They, they're not uh, embracing pro-democracy political reform. Uh, they're not embracing the, the, the huge cause of, of, of social justice uh, in our country. And all of those are big determinants of environmental outcomes. And, and what do you think is the reason for that? Is it, is it the constituency of the environmental movement is more affluent? Uh, is it that it's the way our system works in that we break down issues into their smallest uh, uh, component so that we can do something and feel good about what's been done, even though it doesn't address the broader picture? Well, I think it has a lot of causes. Um, it's, it's what people are comfortable with. People like to work on issues in their comfort zone and where they feel expertise. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, there was, a, uh, I think, a big mistake made among environmentalists uh, around, uh, in 1980, for, to put a number on it, uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected. And um, people didn't realize that there had been a sea change at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, but, but we kept doing, we, I was in it, we kept doing what we had been done, doing before. Mm -hmm. uh, lobbying Washington, bringing in some lawsuits, trying to raise public awareness. But we didn't realize that we had kind of, in a way, we were beginning to lose the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and had, were becoming, you know, Volvo driving, latte drinking, uh, whatever else was in that so inertia, famous, famous right? commercial. That was, so that was part of it. But, um, you know, I think there, uh, I think there is some, uh, uh, something in the funding constituencies uh, that, that hold back uh, some progress in, in some groups, um, where the money's coming from, who's paying the bills. Uh, but um, I would also say this, uh, this segmentation that you mentioned, uh, among the different constituencies or different issue groups is far more severe on, on the progressive side. The siloing is far more progressive mm -hmm. on the, so more severe on the progressive side than it is on the conservative or right wing uh, side. Uh, so you have, um, you know, uh, you have groups uh, on the right uh, like American Enterprise Institute and the Competitive Institute and, Institute and the Heritage Foundation and Cato Institute and others that address all these issues under one roof. Uh, and that's pretty rare, uh, not totally absent, but pretty rare on the progressive uh, side where groups are very segmented and, uh, and tend to be siloed and tend, uh, and, and really haven't figured out how to uh, come together. The, the social justice liberals and the environmentalists really haven't figured out how to come together yet. And, and, and they're, they're divided in part uh, by this, uh, uh, you know, they the, the, the will be, I think, increasingly divided unless they figure out how to come together, divided by this growth issue. Mm -hmm. We have this growth fetish in our country, which uh, uh, I argue in the book uh, is now a problem for, for us uh, in, a, in a big way. I mean, we've had tons of growth in our country 
since 1980, for example. Mm -hmm. The economy is 125 percent bigger than it was in 1980 uh, today. And, um, and, 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 and during this period when the economy grew hugely, hugely, uh, you know, we lost 42,000 manufacturing plants, unemployment, uh, uh, wages flatlined the whole time, literally. Uh, uh, inequality mounted, um, poverty mounted, um, environment declined, uh, life satisfaction flatlined. I mean, what did it get us? It got us a bunch of plutocrats is what it got us. And, um, and, and we, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's now, uh, you know, not, growth is not the way to grow. If we really want to put people back to work in this country, and we should desperately want to do that, I mean, we're going to have to put programs, you know, in place that employ people uh, in the private sector by stimulating certain areas of growth where we need to, to invest in our country. And if we need it, uh, go back to the New Deal model and put people to work doing great things that need to be done in our country. We could use a Civilian Conservation Corps uh, in the U.S. Uh, today rather than, you know, defunding the national park system and other things. So I think there's a, um, uh, there's a uh, you know, there, we, we have to realize that uh, GDP growth, which is what I mean by growth, is really uh, not the way to grow. I mean, it, GDP just collects everything that's happening in the economy, you know, all the uh, repair damage from uh, Sandy, all the, all the work that had to be done to clean up uh, 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 after, you know, the, the uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, spill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it doesn't, we need a measure of real uh, sustainable economic well-being in our country that can compete with GDP and dethrone it because this is such a bad measure of, uh, of, of national progress, and yet we do worship it. Is this uh, part of the failure of the progressive side to develop an all-encompassing narrative uh, that uh, would override this segmentation. At one point, I think you quote uh, Bill Moyers as saying you, you have to have a narrative that relates to the symbols that are embedded in the political culture. Yeah, uh, and, and you need to hammer it home to the point that it topples the old narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need that, and um, I think um, uh, you know, we, there, there's a, a, a lot of uh, 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 work that needs to be done to, to develop uh, that narrative that can explain, uh, you know, why we're in, uh, you know, such a sea of troubles. Uh, why the doing more of the same is not going to get us out of that uh, sea of troubles. And, and what we do need to do, and, and, you know, one thing I found in the book is that um, right, in writing the book, is it, you know, we're underinvesting in trying to um, develop a common vision of a future that's really worth having, the kind of future we would like to live, leave to our, our, our grandchildren. Uh, and uh, we need to do a lot more of that you know, envisioning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the progressives need to come together, not just with a narrative, as you say, which is very important, uh, but with a, uh, uh, a common uh, structure, uh, a, a, an organizational framework uh, for working together, an infrastructure, if you will, um, a, uh, a system of, of, of getting messages into the political process uh, that build a, a, across these issues, a common platform, uh, a common vision for the country. Uh, these, are, these are all, you know, these are deficiencies. I, I say in the book that the, uh, you know, progressives have a strategic deficit disorder. Uh, mm -hmm. A phrase, a phrase that some of my students gave me when I was at Yale. Uh, uh, and, but I'm, I'm curious, let, let's look at uh, the Obama administration's first four years. You have this financial collapse, and, and one of the points you're making in the book is that, you know, government should be creating money, not private banks and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so what you had was the, the, the housing collapse, uh, you had uh, the unemployment, uh, uh, which are sort of key mobilizing issues. This is the crisis that's systemic 
that invites people to run to your book uh, and find solutions. And, and in the end, uh, really nothing happened. The problems linger. And the banks are more concentrated, right. more powerful. And, and the president essentially picked the wrong advisors who essentially avoided the housing crisis and avoided unemployment, but bailed out the banks. So what, what I'm trying to get at is as we're building uh, this narrative, as we're building uh, organizational structures that are all encompassing, we, the, the, maybe it's the reform doesn't work, basically, or it disappoints or it obstructs the, the transforma for transformation that you're, you want. Well, I think, uh, I think you described the situation and what happened uh, quite accurately. Uh, the, um, my, you know, why didn't it do more uh, at uh, this, this terrible crisis that hit us in 2008? Um, I think we weren't prepared um, in the same way that you know, New York wasn't prepared, even though there had been warnings uh, of, of what could happen uh, to the city. Um, the, um, we, you know, we hadn't put the ideas that, that could, uh, have begun to take hold front and center in, in our, uh, in our political discourse. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we were, but so, uh, so I think we, uh, we need to be better prepared, uh, for future crises and, um, they're likely to happen. Mm -hmm. You, you quote, uh, Milton Friedman, who you don't agree with ideologically, but he, he wrote, only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. I think that's a good a good quote, but I'll say that one of the things that um, uh, Naomi Klein does in her wonderful book, The Shock Doctrine, um, is to show how that um, the, the Friedmanites uh, didn't just develop these ideas and have them laying around, mm -hmm. uh, as the quote suggests. Mm -hmm. They've been very aggressive uh, about uh, taking these ideas uh, into the context of the crisis and uh, promoting uh, actions that they favor, which have tended to be, you know, very free market, uh, market-based, market fundamentalism type uh, solutions. And, um, and I think we have been on the progressive uh, side uh, much less successful in, uh, in, in not only in developing the, the deep change ideas, uh, but in you know moving them forward in the context of uh, of a crisis situation, we 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 don't have a progressive movement in the country. We have many progressive movements, and we need to come together. And environmentalists need to see that they are part of that movement. They're not something that's a big tent that sits apart from um, you know from uh, from in effect uh, the, the center center left uh, uh, forces. Why? are progressives so provincial, so embedded in their silo? Is that a consequence of uh, the way they developed out of the 60s, uh, where you had a lot of fragmentation? Is it that they lack money? Or is it that what they're talking about is so counter to the, the American ideal of Horatio Alger, uh, individual economic enterprise and so on? I don't know. I honestly don't know the, the historical uh, origins of this, uh, this situation uh, that, uh, that you aptly described. Um, I suspect it was multiple things, uh, but um, I think, you know, it basically um, most of the progressive causes uh, grew up with successes. Um, and um, and I think that very success in different, in this was the, you know, the, uh, the 60s uh, and, and 70s, uh, early 70s, when a lot of progress was made on, uh, on many different progressive causes. And, you know, that success tended to reinforce the idea that we are structured in the right way. I mean, we can get things done. I um, know that that happened in the environmental area.
um, and uh, didn't force a, um, uh, uh, the right by contrast was a, um, you know, really um, was a, uh, a more of a, a planned movement, uh, not a haphazard uh, uh, gathering of, 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 of causes. Uh, it was far more of a, a planned movement going back to, uh, uh, to Justice Powell's uh, memo that he wrote to the Chamber of Commerce uh, in about 1970 or so uh, before he was a justice. So, so is it is it money that can a plan and money that can build these institutions? Well, it would be uh, a plan for sure, uh, a common strategy, a, a, a commitment to develop a common platform, uh, and um, and a, a sense of common identity uh, of uh, and uh, common victimhood, uh, really, um, and um, but money. You know, there are two things I would say about money. I, I, um, I've started two, or helped to start, uh, two big environmental organizations with large grants from U.S. foundations, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and um, I see most foundations in the U.S. today is, is on the timid side in terms of taking the initiative uh, to do the things uh, that need doing. Uh, those of us who are concerned that we need to be organizing for transformative change uh, uh, have started some new enterprises, some new efforts to, to promote that. One uh, that I'm associated with is the, uh, uh, the New Economics Institute, uh, which is modeled in a roughly on a wonderful group in, in England, uh, the, in the United Kingdom, the New Economics Foundation. Well, we're struggling to get money, and we need money to get busy and to bring these, these new economy forces together across the broad uh, spectrum of issues, and uh, that's a, a serious uh, concern. Uh, so I'm hopeful that you know, some large donors, whether they be individuals or foundations, can really step up to the plate at this moment and, um, uh, and help us build the infrastructure that we need, not only for the sort of broad-based pro-democracy Political reform, uh, but also uh, for you know focusing uh, and developing these new economy ideas. The transition from an economy which prioritizes profit and product and power to one that prioritizes people and place and planet. I mean that is a fundamental shift, and we know a lot about how to make it, uh, but we don't have the muscle right now to do it. Uh, you're really describing an alternative political party, aren't you? Ultimately? Well, I think uh, that would be a great idea to break mm -hmm. the duopoly uh, uh, that we now have. Uh, so how do you do that without being a spoiler in our society? Um, and uh, there are you know, two, one big thing, two things I think that, that can be done to make a third party uh, uh, apparatus, so to speak, a third party movement more, more plausible. Uh, more hopeful, less of a spoiler. Uh, one is to have fusion voting, which New York State has, Vermont has, my state, uh, but in most states uh, the two parties got together and outlawed it. Mm -hmm. Fusion voting meaning? Fusion voting being that a third party can list as its candidate one of the major party candidates. Mm -hmm. So basically it has the ability to sit back and say, you know, which of you guys is going to help us do the things that we want to get done? Uh, that would be nice uh, to see the revival of fusion voting. The other thing would be uh, instant runoff voting, which um, I think you may have uh, in California now, where you vote for a candidate and then you basically you vote for your second choice and if your first choice doesn't win, your third party candidate doesn't, well, then you're, you're, you have an opportunity to vote for another candidate. Uh, and so this is instant runoff voting and um, is linked, and I think, to something that, uh, that you have now in California. I don't know if it's operational yet, which is these open primaries uh, where uh, you can, um, you know, you don't, you, uh, two, two Democrats could win, uh, I think, now in, in California, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or two Republicans. Yeah. Uh, 
I want to ask you, your, your expertise is not in health care, but, but I want to ask you about the dynamics of what has happened because uh, what we see is the role of the court, the Supreme Court. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is the, the progressive cause really benefited from the structures that Roosevelt put in place, basically. And, and part of the success there was the use of the Commerce Clause uh, to say that we had national problems which required national solutions. In the health care decision, the Supreme Court, although it declared uh, uh, the Obamacare uh, constitutional by switching over to the taxing power, right. snuck in the notion that uh, states had autonomy uh, and overturning, uh, I guess, a famous decision uh, or suggesting that they would with regard to the power of the Commerce Clause. Uh, yeah, it's to, very scary. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so, so uh, what I'm getting at is as you think about the existence of alternatives, as you identify this progressive agenda, uh, I think uh, what we have to talk about is the extent to which the, the old guard has control of institutions and can really block progressive efforts. Yeah, well the court is the ultimate example of that, I think, and, and the most intractable unless um, uh, you know, but it all depends on appointments. It really does. Uh, Roosevelt had a huge problem uh, with the court uh, at one point. Um, and you remember the court packing uh, mm -hmm. proposal that he had and the famous expression that came out of that, um, a switch in time save nine. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, Obama may have a chance to change the complexion of the court. Uh, uh, and uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we don't know what the next four years will bring in that regard. But, um, you know, if, if they are, it's a, a, a pretty scary court right now, in, in, in my view. And it's not just the Citizens United case. There have been uh, su cases subsequent to that which uh, further empowered money and rolled back efforts in Arizona and Montana to, uh, to deal uh, with the power of money in, in politics. Now, the good news is it you know, didn't have the results that uh, big money donors expected it to have in this last election. I don't think that means that the power of money is, is gone by any means. Uh, it'll just be better used uh, unless we uh, cut it back. And, and the best way to do that is to amend the Constitution. We need that badly. Uh, but in, and we also need a, a, a new and powerful uh, public financing legislation. We've had that in the presidential election, but it got too small to be useful. Uh, and, um, and, but, you know, there are proposals in Congress from Senator Durbin and others for a combination of, uh, of uh, small donor financing, which is matched uh, generously uh, from, from federal resources. And uh, we need to get this legislation through the Congress. So, so in the end, what, what you're saying is we have to be uh, sat and not satisfied, but we have to uh, uh, be hopeful about modest reform, but understand that in the long term, we have to search out the alternatives, build a movement that can make uh, overall transformation a reality. Exactly. I mean, I think that we have to walk on two legs. Uh, there are things that have to be done now. Uh, uh, you know, tax justice, uh, climate change, uh, jobs. We need strong federal action on those fronts uh, right now. Uh, but uh, in the long run, if we're going to, you know, stop swimming upstream against a current that's stronger than we are, we're going to have to, you know, basically change the system so that uh, these forces aren't as powerful. Uh, and there are other forces at work. And and uh, and in, in the end, I think we have to trust. Um, our, ourselves. We have to trust democracy. Uh, we have to trust uh, people to care enough, uh, to get committed enough that we still have it in us to use our, our democracy uh, in, in ways that can you know, build uh, America the possible. Uh, when I read your book, I, I was impressed by the extent to which it, it's, it's both a, a nice read, but on the other hand, it's a book that you want to go back to because it's almost a, 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 an encyclopedia 
of all the, possi uh, 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 the problems, but also of, of the possibilities. So uh, my last question, I guess, would be, what is, the, what, what is the insight, the most important insight, that you would like to leave our audience with, and also young people, actually? Well, I think the most important insight from, from the book, uh, Harry, uh, is that um, we're go we should be seeing this proliferation of uh, and uh, you know the problems that, that we face, the challenges that the country faces uh, as part of a systemic uh, crisis, uh, as part of a system failure, uh, and not just as isolated uh, problems that we didn't invest enough in education or you know we took some money out of the university system or to do something else or give it back to the taxpayers. These, yeah, these are real, but the real problem is that we have when we have problems across such a, a broad front, encompassing problems, it's not due to small reasons. It's due to the fact that the system is 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 failing us, uh, and 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 so you have to identify. Well, how do we change that system? Well, on on that note, uh, let me show your book again. Thank you for writing it, and and thank you again for uh, taking the time to come on our program. Thank you, Harry. Appreciate thank it. You. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.